Is fluoride in our drinking water really dangerous to our health? RFK Jr., the soon-to-be Secretary of Health, has recommended that fluoride should be removed from drinking water, calling it an industrial waste associated with arthritis, bone fractures, bone cancer, IQ loss, neurodevelopmental disorders, and thyroid disease. If he's right, we might be risking our health with every sip, but experts like Dr. Paul Offit, a researcher at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, has been quick to disagree. He claims that fluoride has been well tested, it clearly and definitively decreases cavities, and it's not associated with any clear evidence of the chronic diseases mentioned in that tweet. So who's right? Is fluoride a dangerous toxin that we need to stop adding to our water immediately, particularly since we already use fluoride toothpaste? So is fluoride in our water not needed anymore? Or is it still a helpful substance that benefits public health? So I'm not interested in politics. As a physician based in New Zealand, where fluoride is also added to the drinking water, in this video I'll explain the fluoride science and cut through the political noise to reveal the true impact on our health. And what I'm going to say here will probably make both support and critics of RFK Jr. a bit cross. Let's start by looking at this question. Does adding fluoride to our water, now that we use fluoride toothpaste, provide any benefits? And as we'll see, the answer has changed with the latest data. We first became aware of a possible connection between fluoride and dental health almost 100 years ago. A dentist moved to Colorado and found lots of local residents with unusual brown stains on their teeth. What's more is that the people with these stains seemed resistant to getting cavities. He started to wonder if there was something in the water that those people were drinking to cause these strange effects. But it wasn't until the 1930s that a scientist discovered what it was. He found that the water in those places where people had those brown stains on their teeth had a chemical in it, and that chemical was called fluoride. That led scientists to an idea. Fluoride in drinking water is doing something to create those brown spots on the teeth, while also making them less likely to decay. But the brown spots aren't exactly desirable, so they wondered if there was a level of fluoride that would prevent cavities but without staining the teeth. The evidence suggested that there was, around one part per million in drinking water, and they were ready to test the idea. The first trial of adding fluoride to drinking water began in the Great Rapids of Michigan in 1945. The results were incredible. The rate of dental cavities for children in the city dropped by more than 60%. This provided powerful evidence of the effectiveness of fluoride in preventing cavities. Other cities in the US and around the globe followed this example of Great Rapids and started adding fluoride to their drinking water. But 1945 is a long time ago, and there's been a lot of research done since then, and now we've got far more up-to-date data. Plus, many countries, including Germany, France and Sweden, do not add fluoride to their water and instead add fluoride to salt and milk. So what's going on? Do we still have any reason to think that fluoridated water is a good idea? To answer that question, let's have a look at a systematic review of the research performed by the Cochrane Organization, and it was published just two months ago. The authors examined hundreds of studies and found that adding fluoride to water leads to less tooth decay in children's baby teeth. It also slightly increases the number of kids with no tooth decay in their permanent teeth. But slight doesn't sound like a big deal, does it? When they had a look at how many kids had no cavities in their baby teeth or adult teeth, the numbers weren't super high. It was just 4% for baby teeth and 3% for adult teeth, so there's not a huge difference. And on the surface, this sounds like a bit of a mystery. How could adding fluoride to drinking water provide massive benefits decades ago, but only slight benefits now? Well, the answer has to do with toothpaste. Once scientists realized what fluoride could do to prevent cavities, they suggested adding it to toothpaste. And fluoride has the greatest effect when it's applied directly to the teeth. So putting it in toothpaste is an obvious way to access its benefits. And abundant research establishes the effectiveness of fluoride in toothpaste. One meta-analysis found that daily brushing with fluoride toothpaste resulted in a 24% reduction in cavities and other signs of tooth decay. And because of this, in many countries, countries we've witnessed a sharp decline in how many cavities people are getting. So does that mean that we don't need to add fluoride to water anymore? Well to answer that question, we need to consider not just the benefits, but also the potential costs of doing so. Which brings us to RFK Jr's claims on the dangers of fluoride. Does it really cause problems like bone fractures and IQ loss? Well let's have a look at his claim about IQ loss first, since it's got the most attention. A report released by the US Department of Health and Human Services 
was all over the news last summer. It seemed to confirm RFK Jr.'s claim about IQ. After a systematic review of the available studies, the authors said that higher levels of fluoride exposure are associated with lower IQ in children. But notice the key point. This effect is only seen at fluoride exposures above the recommended level set by the World Health Organization. So how does that level, which was 1.5 milligrams per liter of water, compare to the level found in water in the USA? Well, in the US, the amount of fluoride in drinking water is actually much lower. It's only 0.5 seven milligrams per liter. So the authors of the study that generated all of that concern even point out that their report doesn't say whether the amount of fluoride added to the US drinking water affects IQ in any negative way. So while we have good evidence that high levels of fluoride can impact IQ, we don't currently have any evidence that levels below the World Health Organization recommendations do. And that raises a key point. It is seldom the case that a particular substance is either 100% beneficial or harmful. It depends on the dose. We need water to survive, for example, but drinking too much water can be fatal. So we always need to have a look at the effects of a specific amount of any substance that we're investigating. So overall, at the fluoride doses used in the USA and New Zealand, there's no evidence that it leads to IQ loss. But what about another problem that RFK Jr. mentions, which is bone fractures? Well, he isn't making this up. There is indeed evidence that too much fluoride can weaken bone structures, leading to fractures. But once again, the risk starts to show at levels of exposure above the World Health Organization recommendations. It's the same story that repeats itself when it comes to other potential issues that RFK Jr. mentions. So fluoride can lead to negative impacts if we get too much of it. But that's why the levels added to drinking water are set low enough to stay under the World Health Organization threshold for safety. So let's have a look at one final health impact that isn't mentioned by RFK Jr.'s tweet, which is fluorosis. So remember those brown spots on people's teeth that led to the discovery of fluoride's role in dental health? Well, those brown spots are known as fluorosis, and they're the result of getting too much fluoride when our teeth are developing. So brown spots are an extreme form of the problem, and this effect is usually milder and it shows up as white streaks or spots. Only in extreme cases of fluorosis does the condition cause problems for our teeth, but otherwise it's just a cosmetic issue. But interestingly, the rates are increasing. In the US, 41% of adolescents have some degree of fluorosis, and that number has almost doubled since 1987. So if these rates are going up, does that mean that we're getting too much fluoride? Well, the study authors highlight an important point to keep in mind. Water is just one source of fluoride. So as we've seen, toothpaste is another, and the rates of fluorosis actually caused the US Department of Health to reduce the recommended level of fluoride in water from one part per million to 0.7 parts per million in 2015. So it's a recognition that context changes. And as it does so, we need to make adjustments in our response to the latest data. Supporters of RFK Jr.'s position would agree, and they would go on to argue that the latest data shows that we need to stop adding fluoride to our water. So what do I think the evidence shows? Well, the latest meta-analysis continues to find a modest benefit from adding fluoride to water, but that benefit is nowhere near as great as what it was initially, and partly this seems to be because of fluoride in toothpaste that's become more common and yet another way for people to get fluoride. Yet cavities remain a massive problem globally. In fact, the World Health Organization finds tooth decay in adult teeth to be the most common health condition today. It seems to me that even a modest help when it comes to one of the leading global health Health problems might be worth doing. This is especially true when you consider that children in poorer and more vulnerable communities may be less likely to have access to toothpaste and consistent dental care. So I work in a semi-rural clinic where a lot of my patients struggle financially to put food on the table, let alone divert resources to their teeth, and children in particular suffer. Too often these vulnerable populations are overlooked in discussions like this, and it's these vulnerable populations that need the help the most. So taking fluoride out of the water supply removes an important support structure for these people, especially when we consider the risks. As we saw, the health problems associated with fluoride, they only show up at levels above the limit set 
by the World Health Organization. So adding fluoride to drinking water still makes sense, but realistically, the people watching this video or who are debating fluoride aren't the ones who are going to get much benefit from fluoride in drinking water. Most of you already know to prioritize your dental hygiene, to use fluoride toothpaste, to brush twice a day to floss, and ideally to use a water pick. Instead, the fluoride in drinking water is there to help vulnerable populations, and at the doses used in the USA and New Zealand, based on the current data, there is limited evidence suggesting significant health downsides for the general population. However, there are questions we should continue to explore. For instance, what impacts are there of these lower levels of fluoride on IQ? Could exposure to fluoride in the womb cause any problems? Also, is drinking water the optimal way to deliver fluoride, or should we consider alternatives like adding it to salt and milk, as done in many European countries? And for those who want to remove fluoride from water, there are filters that will remove it effectively and are readily available. Available. Consumerlab.com have independently tested a variety of water filters, and I highly recommend you check out their website, and I'm not affiliated in any way. But as I said at the outset, I'm not interested in politics, so I'm completely open to the possibility that new data in the years ahead could point us in a different direction. But I worry that arguments about this topic often take attention away from more important things. For example, when it comes to preventing cavities, cutting back on sugary drinks might make a bigger difference than getting fluoride. So one study, for example, showed that kids who liked sweet drinks were 4.3 times more likely to get cavities than kids who preferred non-sweet drinks. And here's where I'm in complete agreement with something else that RFK Jr. is known for. Ultra-processed foods are terrible for our health. Sugary drinks are just one example. Other examples include frozen dinners, packaged snacks, and processed meats like hot dogs. Instead of arguing about fluoride, we should focus on aggressively cutting back these ultra-processed foods in our diet. A meta-analysis done earlier this year found that eating more processed foods was associated with higher risks for heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and all-cause death rates. And part of the reason why ultra-processed foods are bad for us is because of what they contain. They are loaded with sugar, saturated fat, and salt, and all of the research shows that those ingredients are bad for our health. But another part of the problem is what they leave out. When we eat ultra-processed foods, we don't get nearly enough fiber, lean proteins, and nutrient-dense vegetables. So what kind of diet should we be eating instead if we want to maximize positive health outcomes? Well, make sure to check out this next video here, where I walk through specific diet fundamentals that have got overwhelming scientific evidence.